is uh, my joy to be with you guys this week. I have been praying, as I just did, I've been praying for some time the Lord would use this time in my own heart and life. Uh, you know, we, we never want as teachers to be like hypodermic needles, right? We just deliver the medicine and are unaffected by it. We want our own souls to be shaped and affected. In addition, I've been praying for you, that God would use this time uh, both for your spiritual benefit and for your, your progress in the ministry gifts God has given you. As we get started, I just want to know a little bit about you. Let me ask a couple of questions just so I kind of know um, where we are this week. First of all, how many of you are current TMS students? Let me see your hands. Okay, the vast majority of you. How many of you are in the MDiv program? All right, THM? Any other? Okay. Um, how many of you right now currently teach or preach on a weekly basis in some church setting? Let me see your hands. Okay. And then um, how many of you are currently on the pastoral staff of a church? Okay. All right, good. That helps me. Just a little bit of history, though, so you know where I'm coming from. I, I uh, was born into a family where before I, my birth, my dad was a nightclub entertainer, played the bass fiddle for a big band era nightclub act. Uh, my dad was older when I was born. I'm the last of 10 children. And uh, he was saved before I was born. And so when I came into the world, he was a music director in a church, and that was all my life. So we were there every time the doors were open. I made several uh, young professions of faith. Looking back, I don't believe any of them were genuine. It really wasn't until I was 18 years old. Um, that's when I really saw the gospel. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes. I understood my sin, understood the reality that salvation was not found in some plan. It wasn't found in some program. It was found in a person, Jesus Christ. And uh, that was at 18 years old. I went off to college. I'd already decided I was going to be a lawyer. And, uh, you know, after I became a Christian, I started understanding, you know, I, I shouldn't be saying this is what I want to do. I should be calling this God's will for my life. So I did. I just started calling that God's will for my life. Um, but uh, the Lord had other plans. And my junior year in college, he put me in the hospital for a couple of weeks in serious isolation. You know, the nurses shoved my food under the door and, uh, you know, wore masks when they came in the room and full garb. They thought I had this dread disease. So for two weeks, I was alone with nothing but my Bible. And I read through the Gospels in those two weeks, and the Lord used that. I remember the second Thursday night of that time, in the hospital, I remember, like it was yesterday, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't, I don't know what you want with my life, but I just want you to know I want to do it. Whatever that is, you show me, and that's what I want to do. And it was shortly thereafter that the Lord began to make clear a call to ministry. By the way, if you're interested, we'll talk about what constitutes a call at some point this week. If you want to get there, we'll go there. But, um, but anyway, uh, it was through that then that I came to change majors and to pursue the ministry. Throughout college, I preached. Even before I surrendered to a call to ministry, I preached in a prison every Saturday night. It's a great place to learn how to preach because uh, they, they'll show you whether or not they're interested. And, uh, you know, they lay down on the back row. Um, they're just happy to be out of their cells. But, uh, but it was a great experience for me, a wonderful opportunity. In addition, a couple times a week, I was teaching a group of about 150 men going through uh, several things while I, was, while I was in college. And then in, in graduate school, I, I had the opportunity to teach on the undergrad level, teach some Bible and some English as well, which was my minor. But it was in seminary that I pastored my first church. This would have been in 1985, 86, somewhere in there, um, in that basic time frame. Um, I pastored a little church as an interim, called Trinity Baptist Church in Gaffney, South Carolina. Drove about 50 miles to get there Wednesday nights and Sundays, and uh, it was a great experience for me. You know, I would, I would preach, and then I'd put on my tool belt and go fix something in the church, you know, afterwards because it was just a tiny little church, and, um, and it, was a, it was a wonderful first experience. It was in 1983 that I first became exposed to the ministry of John MacArthur while I was in graduate school. I, uh, heard, I read his book on the family. I also heard him on a radio station, a little radio station out of Gaffney, South Carolina, and, um, and really developed a passion for 
his approach to ministry. It was a few years later in 1987 that Sheila and I, my wife and I, decided to move from the Carolinas where we were to L.A. Hadn't been here, hadn't visited. Um, we just loaded up our little Toyota Corolla and we took, I think, about the back 12 inches of a moving van for everything that we, we owned in the world and uh, we drove across country for one reason and that was to be a part of Grace Community Church. And this was my thinking. I felt as a believer growing up in the South, I had never seen a truly biblical New Testament church. And I wanted a model. I wanted something that I could see and touch and smell and say, this is, this is what I want to I do. This is, this is the New Testament model I want to follow. And so we came here thinking we'd be here a couple of years in 1987. Ended up being 16 years. Some of us are slower learners than others. And um, I was, as Mark mentioned, the first 12 years, I was at Grace to You uh, as the managing director there. And then I uh, was involved in the church, of course, helped begin sojourners and, and helped pastor and shepherd there. In 1999, my wife and I decided it was time for us to go pursue the pastorate. And when John heard about that, he asked me if I would stay here uh, and serve as the senior associate pastor at Grace Church and to um, be his assistant which I was thrilled to do, uh, humbled by. Did that for four years, but still had in my heart a desire and a passion to be shepherding God's flock week in and week out. And uh, so in 2003, we, my wife and I just started praying. Uh, we, we needed to wait um, until we uh, cared for my father-in-law, who was dying of cancer here in L.A. In fact, some of you may know him. He was a professor at the Master's College, C.W. Smith. One of the dorms is named after him up there. Uh, that's my father-in-law, and uh, we needed to make sure to care for him through his death. So we did that and, um, and began to pray if the Lord willed, he'd open a place of ministry. And it wasn't too long before a couple of churches had contacted us, and the rest is history. We're now in, in South Lake, which is near DFW. Been there for 12 years. Went there after a difficult church situation. The former pastor had been disciplined out of the church for a breach of integrity. The uh, elders had been disciplined as well, the two other elders. The church uh, had gone down the street, planted another church. The church had split. Um, the, the number of people had dropped drastically. And so I uh, went in there, just wanted to shepherd and care and love, for the, love these people. And by God's grace, uh, they've responded, responded to the word week in and week out. And uh, the Lord has prospered and benefited the ministry over those 12 years. And so that's kind of my history. Any questions about that before we move on? Any, con any context questions? I just want you to know a little bit about my background, just so you understand kind of where I'm coming from. I, I hope you see from that that I love the church. I love the church because Christ loved the church and loves the church. And uh, I know you men are churchmen. That's why you're here. That's what you want to do. I also love expository preaching. I started first learned about expository preaching. I, I think I may have heard one expository sermon before I went to college. I'm not positive. Maybe one. Well, I, I did hear one because it was the message in which I was converted. A uh, guy was preaching through Revelation, and the last two chapters, and got to what won't be in heaven, and I realized I wouldn't be, and uh, the Lord brought me to himself. But I don't remember, certainly not a pattern or history of expository preaching. I was exposed in college and really, the Lord just uh, gave me a passion and love for teaching his word in that way. Because I don't have anything to say, and neither do you. It's only as we have something to say from the scripture that it matters. So, I love to serve Christ by feeding his sheep. That's one of my great passions and also one of the great privileges that we have. And I know that, that you feel that way as well. I want you to turn to one more passage before we look at the syllabus together. Again, just to provide context for what we're doing here, 1 Timothy chapter 4. You're familiar with this text. I'm not going to spend time here. But, but basically, Paul is exhorting Timothy in the use of his spiritual gift and specifically what happens in the corporate worship. Verse 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Here's the, the public ministry of the word. And don't neglect the gift that's been given you. Now notice verse 15. 
take pains with these things. Take pains, um, Bauer defines it this way, to improve by care or study, practice, cultivate. Take pains with, to improve by care or study, to cultivate these things. What's he talking about? Well, in context, the immediate context, he's talking about the public ministry of the word. And of course, as well, in verse 12, his own soul, his own pursuit of Christ's likeness. But clearly it includes the, the ministerial functions of teaching, reading the word, exhorting, teaching. And then he says, be absorbed in them. Literally, be in them is what the text says. Be in them. It means to occupy yourself with, to be devoted to these things. In his commentary, Mount says, it means to continually immerse yourself in them. Now watch what he says next. This is why we're here. So that your progress will be evident to all. Your progress, your move toward an improved state in the public reading of Scripture, the public exhortation, the public teaching, let your progress be evident, visible, clear, plainly seen. Man, I don't care what stage of ministry you may be in at this point, whether you're just beginning or whether you're seasoned and experienced. doesn't matter. This admonition is for every one of us. This is my prayer for myself. It's my prayer for you. Your people, the people whom you serve week in and week out, should see your progress in these things. And I know that's what you want to do. That's why you're here. That's why we're all here this week. Now, just to put the scope of the work that we have into context, if you preach two times a week, now, not, not all of you will. Some of you only have one service a week. But if you preach two times a week for 10 years, you will generate 1,000 sermons. And if you write out in some manuscript form, let's say on average 10 pages a sermon, you will generate 1,000 pages in a year and 10,000 pages in 10 years. 10,000 pages. Just as a point of, of context, that's Romans 1. Okay, So it is a huge task that is ours. Week in and week out, a lot of material to generate, much less to stay fresh and to incorporate variety into your weekly exposition. And of course, the main thing, to make sure the text is accurately understood and accurately presented. In seminary, you're getting the tools for your toolbox to help you in that mission. That's what you're getting. You're just putting tools in the toolbox. You're studying the original languages. You're studying through books and getting the biblical content. You're getting systematic theology. You're getting ministry skills like exegesis and homiletics, etc. You're building a library of print resources that you can use you're learning to use reference books and commentaries and Bible software. You're getting the tools in your toolbox. And as crucial as that is, you need a helpful pattern in using those tools week in and week out. In other words, you need a process that week after week yields consistent results. A defined, repeatable pattern that works regardless of the passage, a sustainable approach over the long haul of ministry, a process that will consistently yield predictable results, an understanding of the authorial intent of the passage, and a clear message that people can understand and follow. That's what this course is about. I want you to look um, at your, your syllabus. First of all, I want you to notice the course title. This frames exactly where we're going this week. A practical process for sequential exposition. A study in Romans. There's the, the essence. My purpose this week, you notice from that title, is not to teach through in great detail the entire book of Romans. That's impossible. 
We have 27 hours. I taught 27 hours on chapter 1 of Romans. So there's no way that we can work our way through the book in anything but a, but a cursory fashion. So that is not my mission this week. Rather, my goal this week is to create and follow a process that will equip you to teach every week regardless of what book you might be in. To borrow the old saying, my goal this week is not to, to give you fish to eat, but rather to teach you how to fish. We're only going to use a small portion of Paul's letter to the Romans as a living example of what that process looks like and what it looks like in the real life of a 21st century pastor who has other responsibilities, other duties. How do you do this? How do you make this happen? As John told me when I was leaving Grace Church to become a senior pastor, he said, done correctly, preparing two sermons a week is like writing two 10-page term papers every week. That's really what it's like. The magnitude of the work before us is truly overwhelming. Nothing is more crucial to your long-term success as a preacher than having a practical, repeatable process that consistently yields results. Ultimately, the quality of your sermons will only be as good as the process you follow in your preparation. This course is designed to help preachers develop that practical, repeatable process for sequential exposition. And we will only use a portion of Paul's magnificent letter to the Romans. I'll give you the flow of Romans, but we're only going to examine in any detail a small portion of Romans. Now, notice the course description. It says, this course uses the epistle of the Romans to instruct the student in the fundamentals of a weekly process for sequential exposition that ensures consistent quality, encourages freshness, and remains true to the authorial intent of the preaching text. Again, the goal of this winter is that process. Doesn't mean mine is the only repeatable process, nor does it mean that you're going to have to slavishly follow, or I'm encouraging you to slavishly follow the process we'll lay out. However, that said, you may tweak the process, but if you're going to be a true expositor, you're going to have to interact with the elements that I'll deal with this week. And you're going to have to follow a very similar pattern and an order because it's the logical order to understanding the text. So again, you, you will suit your own gifts, your own preferences, you'll tweak it, you'll make it fit you, but it's not like this is my process and it doesn't work anywhere else. No, the elements we're going to talk about are essential for every expositor to include in his process, and the basic flow we'll follow is the basic flow you will have to follow if you're going to, if you're going to take the text in a in a historical, grammatical way. If that's the hermeneutic you're going to use, you're going to have to follow the same basic progression. Now, let me just briefly walk through the assignments. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You'll notice uh, the assessment, um, the reading is 30% of your grade, the syntactical analysis and homiletic outline of Romans 3, 9 to 20, and detailed outline of the entire book is 30% of your grade. And then the 20-page sermon manuscript at the end of the course or after the course is over is 40% of your grade. Now, the pre-course requirements, you should have already accomplished those and given a report on that. It was reading, um, reading through Romans several times. We'll talk about why that's important um, either later today or, or tomorrow. Look at the in-course requirements. This is what you need to do this week. And you need to complete these assignments. Notice it says before 8 a.m. on Saturday. And on Saturday, bring those complete, these completed assignments along with another reading report like the one you gave today. All I need is, yes, I read everything assigned or here's what I did read and what I didn't read just so we can um, make, uh, make a grade that fits your, your level of work. So you, you'll read Moo's commentary, um, Morris's commentary. Then you'll do a, a block diagram of Romans 1. We're going to get into block diagramming, what I have in mind, uh, either tomorrow or Wednesday. So you'll have, uh, many of you already know that. You read Kaiser. You have a good feel for what, what we're talking about. But if you have other questions, some of those will be answered as we get to that section. 
You'll submit a syntactical diagram and homiletic outline for Romans 3, 9 to 20. And then a detailed outline of the entire book of Romans down to the paragraph level. You understand what I mean by the paragraph level. The markers, even in your, in your translation, a good English translation, will break the text down into paragraphs. That's, um, that's what I'm looking at. You don't have to go down into individual statements, phrases, or verses, but rather paragraph level. Okay? Any questions about those in-course requirements? Yeah, it's it's essentially it's the same. Yeah, this is just different different way to express it. the The analysis of the syntax, ultimately, the tool to do that, I think, most effectively, is the block diagram, which you read about in Kaiser. So that's all we're talking about. Same thing. Okay, and then post course, uh, you'll notice uh, the assignment before 4:30 p.m. on Friday, January 29th. Write out in full manuscript form a 20-page sermon on either the entire passage there, Romans 3, 9 to 20. That is a classic, classic passage. Paul marshals, I think it's some seven different Old Testament quotes to put together a theology of depravity. It is, it is truly powerful. And so I think you'll enjoy doing that if you haven't studied it. Um, I think it will also give you not only a theological grid for the book of Romans, sort of the backdrop for the book of Romans, but it'll also uh, be a great uh, section for you to share at some point and preach. So I don't think it'll be wasted at all. And then you'll notice I say, or you can do a message on the entire text, or you can choose a, a section of that pericope, uh, you know, whatever is a self-contained unit. You'll see as you look at it that it is, Paul is doing several different things there. He has an introductory statement. He has a concluding statement about our relationship to the law, and then he deals with the different manifestations of depravity. If you want to choose one of those and develop that more thoroughly, that's fine. Or you can do the whole passage. That's really up to you. Okay? And then uh, notice that the important thing here is you're to try to use each step of the process that we'll go through in this course, and at the end of the sermon, you should simply write, I have endeavored to follow the process we learned in class just so I know that you didn't just do what you wanted to do all right that's not the point okay any questions any questions about that great I, I hope uh, I hope that's the right uh, volume of work I hope you don't feel like it's too little or too much and I hope it'll be an encouragement to you I, I have thoroughly enjoyed those things myself and I think you will as you work through them all right, now that's where we're going. Let me give you a road map for the week. With that in mind, with that large picture in mind, let me tell you kind of where we're, where we're heading over the next six days. By the way, I need somebody or maybe a couple of you to give me a heads up uh, when it's break time. I think that we get about a 10-minute break per hour, so maybe at, 15, at 50 minutes into the hour, kind of give me the high sign so we can give you a quick break. And um, if you maybe together, because I'll get completely lost in what I'm doing and we'll miss our breaks. All right. So here's where we're going this week. First of all, and, and this is going to be a significant focus of today. I've called it introduction, reviewing the biblical foundations. I want to look at the foundational presuppositions behind expository preaching and then I want to consider something that isn't often addressed, and that is the primary arguments for consecutive e exposition. Why should we make the focus of our ministry going through books of the Bible verse by verse? Uh, that's usually sort of assumed, but I don't think often defended. And I, I want to do that. I think it's important for us to do that together. Then the second part of the, of the week, and we'll get to this, I hope, before the day's out today, and then it'll, it'll absorb several days, and that is exegesis, studying the biblical text. So after the introductory material that we'll cover in large part today, then we'll look at the, the, the process. Again, 
you're getting the tools. I'm not interested in the tools. I'm not going to teach you Greek in here. I'm not the best person to do that, although I had six years of that in seminary. I, that's not why we're here. I want to give you instead that repeatable process for using the tools you're getting in producing an exegetical study of the passage that you're faced with each week that, that works, that's consistent. And then third, or, uh, thirdly, which is the, the, really the second major point of the week, is exposition. Taking that exegesis, taking that, that spade work that you've done in studying the text and crafting from that exegesis an expository sermon. Shaping, defining the, the, all of the material that you have, you have mined from that text into a sermon that, that is clear, that your people can follow, that takes the bridge from, from, the, from the ancient world to the modern context. Um, we want to look at that together. And then finally, we'll look at delivery, preaching an expository sermon. We won't spend much time on that, probably just a portion of Saturday, but I want to deal with that because there, mostly delivery is to be natural. But there are some key principles that I think will be helpful um, in that context. So that's kind of where we're going. Introduction, then exegesis, studying the biblical text, exposition, crafting an expository sermon, and then delivery, preaching an expository sermon. That's the roadmap for this week. I can't promise you, it'll depend on questions you have, it'll depend on on you know how much I get caught up in what in something we're talking about can't promise you exactly where we'll be each day but generally we'll cover introduction today and we'll begin Lord willing exegesis and then we'll be several days in ex in exegesis and toward the end of the week probably um, Friday we'll get to creating uh, crafting an expository sermon and then delivery preaching expository sermon okay all right so that's where we're going. This morning, though, I want to begin with laying the foundation before we get to the process itself. Now, I don't plan to exhaust these foundational issues. Um, I'm going to leave much unsaid that could be said about them. As you know, that's what you say when you don't have anything else to say. Um, but, but what I do want to do is I want to address these foundational issues for a couple of reasons. One, because often we just assume and when we're confronted with, well, who said we need to preach through the Bible verse by verse? Where do you get that from the Bible? Or what's your defense for that? We're sort of caught off guard. We're not really ready to answer that question. Secondly, I'm not going to assume that every one of us sitting here this morning are equally committed to expository preaching in its fullest form. And so I want to explain and sort of lay a foundation for why it is important. And then I also don't want to assume, uh, sadly, while most of you men will leave the Master's Seminary and be committed to what you learned here and, and be faithful through the years of ministry God gives you, I also know that there will be some who will be tempted when they get out in a ministry and, and it's struggling, it's not going as well as you'd like, to look around and say, wow, the, you know, the guy down the street, his church is growing and look at what he's doing. Maybe, maybe this is outdated maybe this is antiquated maybe I need to do something else in your heart of hearts I can promise you this if you're in a situation where where your church is not growing as you'd like for it to grow and maybe even you're facing some decline but you're surrounded by churches that are that are thriving or appear to be thriving on the surface and they're doing you know all of the seeker sensitive stuff and all of the stuff that the you know the the dog and pony show that goes on around the the churches, you're going to be tempted. I'm not saying you'll do it, but you're going to be tempted to at least question these foundations. And that's why I think it's so important before you get to that place to have the foundation laid solidly in your mind. So whatever happens, back to 1 Corinthians 12, God is the sovereign not only of the gift I have, the place where I use that gift, but even the outcome where I remain committed to doing what I'm doing. Again, showing progress. You know, there are people who call themselves expositional preachers who kill a ministry because of how they do it. But showing progress in your gift, but not changing your basic philosophy, your basic approach to ministry. 
So, it's important to remind ourselves then of these, of these foundations. So I want to first of all consider, as we look at the sort of introduction, this is where we are today, I want to look at the issue of the foundational presuppositions of expository preaching. You're familiar with the history of a famous architectural feature in Italy. It was on August 8th, 1173, that the Italian city of Pisa began work on what would eventually become its most famous piece of architecture. It was to be a freestanding bell tower for the cathedral. The tower was designed to be eight stories or about 185 feet tall. The construction of the tower took over 177 years and was completed in three phases. When construction reached just the second of eight floors, five short years after they began the project, the builders noticed they had a problem. The tower had already started to sink and to lean to one side. This was caused by two problems. First of all, it was caused by a softer subsoil, a, a weak, unstable subsoil than they thought. And secondly, they made the foundation too shallow. The foundation is only about 10 feet deep for a building that was to stand 185 feet tall. Today, the tower has stood for over 800 years, but at the top, it leans 13 feet off of vertical. Within the last 10 to 20 years, they moved tons of dirt from, from the side opposite the lean in order to sort of give it a chance to pull back the other way. Engineers now say that for the very first time in its 800-year history, they've stopped the leaning from happening further. It should be safe, they say, for another 200 years without fear of toppling. But, here's the bad news, the experts say that one day the Leaning Tower of Pisa will fall. It will fall. And the reason is simply this. It was built on a bad foundation. That is such a powerful analogy to how many people build a church. Just as the church building can be built on a faulty foundation and therefore fail to endure over the years, in the same way, the living organism that is the church can also be built on a faulty foundation. And over time, cracks begin to appear. The lean begins to happen. And left unaddressed, the living organism that is the church, it also will collapse. The foundation is crucial. And the right foundation, as you know, is the word of God. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here Paul explains to his young son Timothy, whom he's left in Ephesus to pastor there, why he's written this letter. Verse 14, he says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Paul obviously writes, and, and notice the word he uses here, the word you will know how to conduct yourself. The word means to conduct oneself by certain principles is the idea. So that you will have sort of the, the guidelines for church. Now that simple statement by Paul is monumental. I want you to think with me for just a moment about the implications of just that one statement. I want you to know how to conduct yourself in the household of God or the church. First of all, that statement implies that how a particular local church conducts itself matters to Christ. 
Think about that for a moment. How a local church conducts itself matters to Christ. Again, that picture of Revelation 1 where Christ is walking among the lampstands, the the letters to the churches there in chapters 2 and 3. Those of you who are already serving in a church, what happens at your church, how you conduct church where you are matters to Jesus Christ. Secondly, there's another there's another implication of that statement in verse 15, and that is there are wrong ways to do church. There are wrong ways to do church. Unfortunately, that's not widely understood. You know, the guys hang their shingle in the nearest strip mall and they start a church and they think whatever they want to do is fine. Paul clearly, even though Timothy was a disciple of his, had traveled with him, had been placed there by Paul, Paul says, Timothy, there are wrong ways for you to do this. And I want to make sure you do it the right way. Thirdly, implied in that statement in verse 15, is that Christians, even Christian leaders, don't automatically know how they ought to conduct themselves in the church. It doesn't just happen. You don't just get a pastoral position and know how this ought to be done. Even having attached yourself to someone like Paul doesn't mean you don't need further instruction. Number four, the fourth implication out of that simple statement in verse 15 is that no church or church leader gets to establish its own guiding principles or philosophy for doing church. Paul says, I want to give you the principles by which you conduct life in the church. Implied in that is, you don't get to decide them. That's not your prerogative. And number five, another, you just see the richness of, of the scripture here. In the simple statement, I'm writing so that you will know how to, one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, that is the church. A fifth implication is that God has told us how to do church, and we are all responsible to conduct ourselves in that way. Now, we're not talking here about methodology. We're not talking about whether or not you have a nursery, whether or not you have you know, contemporary music or, or traditional music. We're not talking about methodology, although some methods do work better with the priority Scripture is set than others. We're not talking about style whether it's the whole traditional versus contemporary thing and and all of that. There are churches that are primarily contemporary and have a praise band and churches that are traditional and sing only hymns or even psalms that are missing some of the, the hallmarks that mark a biblical church that are laid out here in the pastoral epistles. So the style isn't the issue. There are churches on both sides of the style issue that reflect the that reflect the biblical priorities. What we're talking about is a biblical philosophy of ministry. That's what Paul was giving. A set of non-negotiable biblical principles that guide the choices and decisions made in a church. Now where do we find the principles that, that determine, that guide the choices and decisions made in the church? Where do we find them? Well, they're woven throughout the three books we call the pastoral epistles. First and Second Timothy and Titus. In fact, in these three epistles, there are several, I wish we had time to walk through them, I really don't, but several essential hallmarks for a biblical philosophy of ministry. Let me give them to you, and I just want to consider one briefly in this introductory material. Here are, here are several that when I taught through this, I identified from the pastoral epistles and that I think are transparently obvious in the pastoral epistles. Number one, a high view of God. Read the pastoral epistles and watch what Paul says about God. Secondly, a high view of Scripture. We're going to come back to that one. Thirdly, a biblical view of man. So much of the bad church that's done out there is because there's a flawed view of man. I mean, you read... Of course, he's kind of the grandfather of this movement now, but you read um, The Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren, and, and what does he say? He basically says, 
you know, if I can find the key to a man's heart, I can lead anyone to Christ. That's a flawed view of man. His, his, do, his anthropology, as well as his martiology, is seriously flawed. You have to have a biblical view of man, and Paul clearly engages with that in the pastoral epistles. Fourthly, you have to have a biblical view of the church. And, wow, does he give Timothy and Titus a biblical view of the church? What the church is about and how it functions. And then finally, I, I would add a fifth one, uh, the central place of Christ in the gospel. Again, read the pastoral epistles and you will see that Christ and the gospels were at the center of the ministry of the Apostle Paul and he wanted those to be at the center of the ministry of, of Timothy and of Titus. So those are, that's kind of an overview of a biblical philosophy of ministry. Let's go back and hone in on the one, a high view of scripture. I want to just briefly consider this as we as we look at the foundational presuppositions of expository preaching. What is a high view of Scripture? What does that mean? It means a deep or high respect for the Bible. This is part of the foundational purpose for the church's existence. Look back at 1 Timothy 3.15 again. In case I am delayed, I write to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church. We're talking now about the assembly, not the buildings, but the people. It's, notice, the assembly of the living God. It belongs to God. My church isn't my church. You know, I, I talk about my church. I don't mean that in the ultimate sense. I just mean the one I'm identified with. It's not my church. It's the church of the living God. It's, it's Christ's church, specifically. Then notice how Paul identifies the church. He says, it is the pillar and support of of the truth. Do you see? Here is the foundational reason for the church's existence. It is the pillar and support of the truth. The word pillar speaks of that which provides support or holds up the roof. He's writing to Timothy there in Ephesus. He may have even been sort of alluding to the great temple of Artemis that was there in Ephesus with its massive columns. The church exists to hold up the truth. It's a pillar. And notice support. That describes a firm base. The church is the foundation on which the truth rests. So the church both holds up the truth in the sense of teaching and guarding the truth, and the church provides a firm base from which the truth is taught. Obviously, the truth is only found in one source. Our Lord himself defined the source of truth in John 17, 17. Your word is truth. So, a genuinely biblical church will have a high view of Scripture. But what does that mean? Well, when you work through the pastoral epistles, you begin to see that Paul was confident of certain qualities of the Scripture. In the context of these letters, to teach Timothy and to teach us how to do church, Paul expects us to have the same confidence in those qualities of Scripture that he had. 